it's the astonishing increase in, in, the, in the income of ordinary people in the world since 1800. And it's very important to realize how big it was. Even if you include the now very poor countries like Bangladesh and Chad, there's been an increase since 1800 by a factor of 10. That's not 10%, that's 10 times more um, uh, ice cream and bread and education and whatever since 1800. And then in countries like Australia or, or Germany that have been able to um, exploit it, or ex exploit isn't quite the word, take advantage of modern innovations, uh, it's more like a factor of 30. <laughs> and that had never happened before. So the great enrichment is a very good way of talking about it, I think. The usual way that economists and historians talk about it is to say, oh, well, it was trade or investment, or if, if they're from the left, they say exploitation or the slave trade or whatever. And those don't make much sense. What what does make sense is innovation, novelties, new ways of doing things, both machines, new machines, but also new institutions like the founding of the University of Berlin, which was the first modern university. And then you, and, and that just increased, that, that, the, the innovation just went completely crazy in the early 19th century. So the, the problem is to explain why that happened. And that, I think, is basically because of the birth in Northwestern Europe of equality. Until really the late 19th century, if you look at, and I'd be, I'd be very interested here about what the situation is in the comparable um, German language uh, um, dictionaries. In the English language dictionaries, the word innovation is a scary, bad thing associated with heresy. Oh no, we don't want to innovate until really the late 19th century. And then by now, everyone says, oh, innovation, how wonderful improvement, progress, invention. They all have this uh, suspect quality. They're all, uh, don't do any of that. We gotta keep things the way they were is very much the old way of looking at it. And then it changed. And ordinary people in a, in a phrase that's very popular in England and, the, and Australia, ordinary people felt they could have a go. That is, ordinary people felt that they could invent things. In the 19th century, there were the bosses who owned the physical capital, and there were our ancestors, <laughs> the proletariat, who just owned their back and their hands. Now, everyone in this room owns his or her human capital between your ears, and most income comes from human capital. It doesn't come from physical capital. Look, 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 look at these cameras. Those were once substantial pieces of capital equipment. Now they're so cheap that any fool can be a camera person. <laughs> or an interviewer. <laughs> or a, or a, or a, a, t a teacher of economics. I don't think it's important at all. Now, I, I, that's very offensive, I, I understand, um, because a lot of people have been hurt by the global financial crisis. And, but, but as a historian, I, 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 I want to tell them, look, this has happened a lot before. There have been 40 recessions in the British economy since 1800. Four zero, 40. Um, and and about a half dozen of them have been as bad as the current one we're gradually getting out of. And of course, the 1930s was much worse. That was really a catastrophe. Yet each time, each time the economy goes up afterwards, 
Sometimes it takes a long time, as it is doing right now. But eventually, the average bloke and bloke S um, are better off than they were before. So our ancestors were all very poor, and here we are. Look at us now. It has. It has. I'm, I'm, I'm touting the word humanomics as a way to get back to a broader economics that leaves humans in. Historical economics, the history of the intellectual um, life of thinking about the economy, we call it the history of economic thought. Both of those have been banished from graduate programs in economics, which is crazy. It's a terrible thing to do because it means that economists don't um, have any challenge to the what I call Samuelsonian economics, the kind of narrow, uh, maximizing talk that, that emphasizes one human, one virtue of humans, which is prudence. But grass and rats are also prudent. But grass and rats don't have the other virtues that humans do, courage, uh, um, justice, some kinds of love, uh, um, temperance, faith, hope. And when you add those in, you get a fuller picture. Some of my colleagues, like Robert Gordon and Tyler Cohen, who say, oh, innovation is exhausted. The, the rich countries won't get any richer, and so on and so forth. And I, I doubt that they're correct, because pe people have said that before. Economists have said that before many times. And they've always been wrong. So I don't know why they, these friends of mine, they're both friends of mine, think things are going to get bad. But what they would agree with is obvious, is that the countries that haven't yet taken advantage of the innovations of the modern world entirely, like China and India and Africa and South America, they're going to catch up. That's my opinion. And I don't see why they wouldn't. Uh, they, um, their governments can stop it if they're foolish. But more and more with all these examples, the East Asian tigers, but then um, Botswana, and uh, then ch these big examples of China and India doing very well by having better government, not perfect, but better than they had before, and allowing people to um, experiment, to try out new ways of doing things. This has had an enormous effect on the income of the world and will continue to for many, many um, decades. Keynes, in his famous essay, The Economic Prospects for Our Grandchildren, um, said what I'm saying, said that, uh, well, part of what I'm saying, he said that we, we, we could all get to the point where economists were like dentists, he said, and didn't matter much, and we'd all be very rich. Um, but certainly um, the optimism of a person like Theodore Schultz, the great agricultural economist, who I knew when he was an old man, um, shines through. And uh, um, M Milton Friedman's devotion to liberty. Um, there's an awful lot of silly talk about how globalization and Milton Friedman have impoverished the world. This is hooey. This is nonsense. Globalization and Milton Friedman, if you want to put it on Milton, have enriched the world. The world is now richer than it has, I mean, for poor people, is richer than it ever has been in history. And it's growing faster every year than it ever has in history. Look, India, 5% real growth rate per year, 6% for 20 years. Um, China, 9 or 10% per year for 30 years. 
And that's continuing. So I'm optimistic. Thank you.